Um, welcome to uh, Medicine Grand Rounds for this first week here in October. I'm very excited to introduce um, our speaker for today. Um, and, uh, um, and that will be someone who will be known to uh, uh, many of you, and it's Dr. Barry Silverman. Dr. Silverman uh, is from uh, the Midwest, from Ohio, which is where I hail from, so I was thrilled to see that. Attended Ohio State University, where he received his bachelor's in medical degrees. He completed his medical residency at Vanderbilt University Hospital in Nashville, um, and then served two years in the heart disease and stroke control program of the U.S. Public Health Service Corps at CDC. He then completed his cardiology fellowship at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore and was recruited by Emory to start a cardiology teaching program at Northside Hospital um, uh, here um, and joined faculty in 1973. He was the chief of cardiology at Northside from 1973 to 2008 and directed the education program at the hospital. Um, uh, he has also been teaching students and fellows at Grady from 1973 until the current time. In addition to all of that, he was editor of Atlanta Medicine for uh, 25 years, has written many articles, book chapters, and has held several leadership roles, um, both locally with the Medical Association of Atlanta, as well as the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, the American Osler Society, and uh, has received um, awards from all of those groups. So Dr. Silverman, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. He's here to talk to us about um, a, a, a topic I think that is really critical for all of us, uh, professionalism in medicine, and, uh, with a talk entitled Manners, Morals, and Medical Care. And, uh, and let me let you take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Armstrong. Thank you, and Dr. McMillan, for inviting me. I want to comment that in my history of medical education, that 99% of the conferences are on medical science. Uh, this conference on the art of medicine is rare and unusual, yet we all know that the art of medicine is almost as critical as the science of medicine in treating our patients. We recognize that if patients don't trust us, they don't give us the whole story, they don't follow our diagnostic advice, and they don't take our medicines. So, this talk is going to be about improving those skills. Now, I know all of you are adults, and all of you had parents and teachers that taught you good manners when you were young and, and really questioned whether you need to learn about manners as adults. But I hope to show you in this book uh, why your behavior at the bedside can make a tremendous difference in the care of your patients. Well, we're going to start off with one of the more famous physicians, Hawkeye Pierce. Now you'll remember, and the book discusses the change in how doctors are viewed. When I was young, Marcus Welby, Dr. Kildare, they were revered, wonderful physicians. And then actually, when I started on the Emory faculty in the 1970s, came MASH and Hawkeye. You remember Hawkeye, known for his casual dress, his boisterous humor, his chauvinism for sure, his practical jokes, and his perpetual state of intoxication. Yet we loved him, we thought that he was unbelievable with his compassion, his surgical skill, and his indefatability. Just really an admired person for those of us who watch the show. But should we have admired him? Jerry Sugarman raised his question in the Journal of uh, Medical Ethics, in which he said this behavior was a mistake. And you know, one of the things that Hawkeye was doing was he thought that he was a soldier in a war against disease. And you have to remember that if you're a soldier and you're fighting disease, then the battlefield is the patient. And you know how battlefields end up in wars. So that's exactly what this book is about. How for your patient not to end up as part of that battlefield. Let's see if I can advance the slide. Well, we've been talking about physician behavior for 2,500 years in Western medicine. It's part of the Hippocratic course. There's a essay in the uh, Hippocratic corpus uh, called Decorum. And you know, in the Hippocratic oath, the physician is instructed to be in good behavior when he's in the homes of, uh, of patients. Uh, Austin Flint, the famous uh, 19th century physician who actually started two medical schools and wrote an important textbook of medicine, commented to the AMA that the medical profession receives not a little ridicule for observing rules of etiquette. 
but their observance is a protection not only against embarrassment, embarrassment and confusion, but misapprehensions and uh, disillusions that can be injurious to physicians and patients alike. You know, this lecture is about the following comment. It's felt that uh, Maimonides, the great uh, physician of the uh, Middle Ages, said uh, that the good physician treats a disease and the great physician treats the patient. We've all heard this, but we rarely discuss what does this really mean? Well, I wrote a book and the impetus for this book was both patients questioning the way they were treated by certain physicians and asking me, was that appropriate behavior? And in my leadership position, I often found that there were conflicts almost every week related to physician behaviors, that malpractice or poor practice was very rare, but this problems related to behaviors were very common. So in this book, we use real case studies to illustrate how your bedside manners and effective doctor-patient communication are the heart and art of medical care. We have biographies about mentors. One of the questions if you read the literature is, can you teach adults virtue? Can you teach them good manners? Well, Aristotle said the best way for adults to learn manners are to have role models that they see do good, are good. Well, those are our mentors. And I mention a number of mentors in this book and I'm gonna present some to you. Then professionalism has become an increasingly important subject to teach medical students in the 21st century. And we talk about professionalism and the history of professionalism from John Gregory to Thomas Percival. Uh, and I'll tell you about that. Finally, there's some issues that have become important 21st century issues that we need to discuss and they're brought up in the book. And that includes sexual and medical student harassment. And you've heard a lot with COVID about medical burnout, but medical burnout was an issue way before COVID. In fact, there were reports that over 50% of doctors suffer burnout. And burnout is recognized to be a serious issue among medical students and residents. So we talk about how to recognize it and how to deal with it. Well, this cartoon, uh, the patient is not uh, too excited about Dr. Delgado praying at the bedside. It doesn't instill a lot of confidence. So what does instill confidence? What does care for the patient really mean? Well, I told you we were gonna talk about Francis Peabody and he wrote a, a, a case study in 1927 that was published in JAMA that for many years was handed out to every medical student in America. And I had a case just a year ago that I had um, contact with, was almost identical to his case. My case was a 44 year old wife and mother who worked as a supervisor in the school board accounting system. She developed nausea, abdominal pain, had a 20 pound weight loss, severe fatigue. She underwent a very thorough and extensive evaluation and they couldn't find any disorder. Her symptoms persisted and she was really unable to work because of these symptoms. Well, Dr. Peabody, in quoting his article, he said the chief criticism to be made of the way Mrs. Brown case was handled is the staff was, as soon as organic disease was excluded, the whole problem was given up. Her doctor told her there was nothing wrong with her, come back in six months. As he said, Candidly speaking, the case was a medical failure because the patient went home with the assurance that there was nothing wrong with her, but she was still sick. Well, what had not been considered by her physician in this case, and of course, this is my case. This young woman had recently been promoted to a new and challenging position. She had a 10-year-old that was home with virtual school, and that was very demanding on her time. Her husband had a job in which he had a contact with a number of individuals and she had an autoimmune disease and she was very worried about exposure. And her father had recently moved in with them, diagnosed with early dementia. So a lot of stress on this woman. And for this woman, it became, I cannot deal with my life situation became, I cannot stand this abdominal pain. And Peabody said, medically speaking, not a serious case as regards prospective death but extremely serious as regards prospective life. 
The symptoms rarely prove to be fatal, but they may be long and miserable, and the patient frequently extorts their family and really extends them, and that was true in this case. Well, she gave up on that doctor, and she saw another doctor, and that doctor reviewed all her studies, didn't repeat anything, listened to her story, and then he saw her once a month, not in six months, once a month, to listen to her story, to encourage her, to help her deal with her problems. And, you know, after three months, she got better and her symptoms resolved. So just that support, just that considering her as a person made a tremendous difference in her treatment. Well, it's really sad, but studies have demonstrated that communication skills decline as we go through our training. Is what happens is you think you understand the disease, you recognize the diagnosis, and you talk less to the patients. And also, we tend to avoid discussing emotional and social issues. Uh, I remember a grand rounds in which uh, we were told that um, problems related to abuse in the home were common and that we should raise this with every patient we see. And you know, I did raise that with a number of patients, and then I had a patient that wanted to bring her husband in so I would talk with him. That was pretty stressful. So these issues are out there. Um, we're all concerned that the 15 minute office visit is just not enough time, but it is what is in medicine. And we have to recognize that we need to get the story. We need to understand the patient and this can be achieved within the limits of what we have. Well, what is manners-based medicine? We use this term in the book because you're all familiar with evidence-based medicine. That is following scientific evidence and you can improve the quality of care of your patient. But we're saying if you follow good manners, if you have attitudes and behaviors that reflect good manners, that that's gonna make a difference. And then we want you to be aware of the hidden curriculum. The hidden curriculum is what you see around you, not only in the hospital, but Hawkeye Pierce is an example of the hidden curriculum. Heroes that you see on television that you might want to emulate. Residents, fellows, attendings, the way they treat patients. Well, the book wants to tell you what are good examples, what are the good ways to treat it, and for you to seek those out in the people that you have contact with and notice how it helps them take care of their patients. Well, there, I told you there are rules, and these are my favorite rules. If you go to the Mayo Clinic, they have the Mayo Clinic, uh, the Mayo Brothers rules uh, called Desk Book, the rules of 1927. Now, if you haven't been to Rochester, Minnesota, it's in the middle of nowhere. And I can tell you that maybe the Mayo Brothers were exceptional physicians, but to get to Rochester at the turn of the uh, 20th century was not easy. And what made that clinic successful is not only the great medicine they provided, but the way they provided uh, care for those patients. You know, it's a tradition at the Mayo Clinic for the doctors to wear a suit. The Mayo brothers were concerned not only in good medicine, but how the appearance to the patient. There are 14 rules, but I've written down four of them here that I wanna share with you that gives you an idea of the kind of rules they're talking about. They said neglect of the patient means you're in the wrong profession. A smile at the right time can alleviate the sting of a bad prognosis that to each patient, the present illness stands preeminent. May we consider the, we sometimes consider the illness trivial or neuro, but the patient has spent time and money seeking relief and should have just and polite consideration. And the final one of their rules is sheer bad manners denote without a doubt that a fundamental mistake has been made. The doctor has taken the wrong avocation. And you know, those are the kind of rules that you should have in front of you. And in fact, in the Mayo Clinic, they do have in front of them every day to remind them about their behaviors. Well, we have a chapter on professionalism. And uh, here in this uh, cartoon, you can see uh, that uh, he's sorry that uh, the patient's death has buggered up their statistics of uh, how well they're doing. And uh, sometimes you feel that you're under those pressures. Well, this is a direct quote uh, from the uh, book. I'm going to see because some of these pictures here uh, are covering my able to read the slides. But um, annual nerves, bones of the hands, muscle and origins, insertions and innervations, first line treatments, space bugs, 
Krebs cycle, oxidative phosphorylation. Your medical training requires memorization, identification of all of it, and much more. You will memorize, understand complex facts and theories, learn to diagnose and treat diseases straightforward and complex, and learn to comfort the ill. The medical professionals include the mastery of all these scientific subjects, but it also includes ethics, moral responsibility, lifelong education, stewardship of resources and advancing the science. Yet that does not get to the core of the idea of what medical professionalism is. It's a way of being, it's an expression of the idea that one's career is a process of becoming a better doctor, nurse or paraprofessional, and echoes the expression of the practice of medicine, not of the doing of medicine. And that's what we want you to take away from medical school and training, that feeling, a uh, lifelong feeling. Well, one of the mentors in this chapter is one of my favorites, and this is Edmund uh, Pellegrino. And uh, he was uh, head of uh, Dean of Medical Schools, head of medicine, and went on to be the chief of uh, bioethics uh, at Georgetown and the Biomethics Ethics Institute is named for him there. And there is a philosophy of medicine, a philosophy that you have to deal with on a daily basis. He said that acting for the good of the patient is the most ancient and universally acknowledged principle in medical ethics. It is the ultimate court of appeal for the morality of your medical acts. But what is the good of the patient? And he discusses that. The ultimate good, what you think is a biomedical good, what the patient perceives as those goods. These are things that you really have to think about in your practice every day when you're making decisions. And I think learning about uh, Dr. Pellegrino and reading some of his philosophy, uh, you'll find very enlightening and a fun uh, exercise in improving your bedside uh, skills. In this chapter, we talk about the history, Western history of professionalism. It really began with John Gregory at the, uh, in the 18th century at Edinburgh. And early medical ethics was really about physician behavior. I guess those 19th century physicians were pretty tough on a lot of patients. And John Gregory talked about being empathetic and caring for our patients. And one of his students was Thomas Principal, uh, Thomas, uh, I'm blocking on his name here, uh, Thomas Percival, excuse me. And um, he wrote a code of ethics that was then taken up by the American Medical Association and became an early code of ethics about how physicians behave. And that was really what Austin Flint was referring to in that quote that I gave you. This chapter also talks about moral principles. You know, after the Nuremberg trials, they recognized the Nazi experiments on, uh, on captured uh, uh, slaves and uh, prisoners. And they wrote a code about how medical uh, ethics should be involved in research. This was followed by the Declaration of Helsinki in 1964. It further extended the Nuremberg Code and the recognition of how we should treat subjects and patients. And then in 1974, the Tuskegee experiment became exposed. And that was the experiment in when African-Americans with syphilis were being observed and even after treatment, penicillin for syphilis became available, they were not treated with that effective treatment. And that led Congress to uh, initiate the Belmont Report. And that is really what we follow today in which we have to have respect for the patients. There has to be beneficence in everything we do. And there has to be social justice in the studies that we carry out and the way we treat patients. And I think that every student should learn about this and understand this. Uh, it's an important part of our practice. Well, the next chapter is on manners and morals and medical care, and it's what does it mean? I told you that the Hippocratic Oath required that the physician have good behavior, and that's because in those days, physicians were allowed into a person's house, and therefore they have a special responsibility. I'm gonna quote this directly because it talks about how we have a special responsibility. Patients bear their body voluntarily, prepared to suffer the poking and prodding into crevices where none others have ventured, bravely suffer the insertion of sharp, painful instruments where none should go, and they pay for that experience. 
It's not a bizarre initiation rite, and the patient has not stumbled into a terrorist den. They are in the doctor's office. Because they allow you to do this, you have a special responsibility in the way you treat them. Well, the philosopher of manners is Judith Martin, who read any of her books. And one of the things that she points out that I think is so relevant to all of us, because we all think we're good people, we all think we're virtuous, but she points out that just because we believe we have those uh, attitudes, it doesn't mean that we actually follow them when we do things. And I'm gonna give you an example of that. So there is a difference between manners and etiquette, and I accept that. And why I told you that the Mayo Clinic, they still wear suits, most of you have on scrub clothes, and that is fine. That's just the way uh, change has occurred. But manners don't change. Manners are about respect and civility. And we have to watch those around us and be sure that we're not picking up bad behaviors as part of the hidden curriculum. Well, I don't want to go into this in too depth, but there's books on civility. So you can understand it's not just a simple, easy thing to understand. Uh, I will also point out that if your patients like you, if they respect you, they'll tell you their whole story. And if they don't, they will clam up and you won't really find out what's going on. So good manners encourage good communication. Well, here is another of my favorite heroes. This is Helen Tausick. Helen overcame more problems than you can imagine. She was dyslexic, hearing disabled. She was discriminated on multiple levels. Even though her father was a famous professor at Harvard, she couldn't uh, go to Harvard Medical School. They didn't accept women. She went to Johns Hopkins, which accepted women only because women were on the uh, board that uh, got money to open the medical school. And there, she really was an innovator. She created what we know as pediatric cardiology. She was one of the first people to really develop uh, open heart surgery. She had unbelievable scientific advancements, but never given the recognition at her own school that she should have uh, advanced a professorship very late. I had a chance to work with her at the bedside and she was remarkable. She had such empathy and care. She was just wonderful to be around. I think you'll really enjoy reading her story. It's a miraculous history. Well, here, this represents us, of course. Of course, I'm listening to your expression of spiritual suffering. Isn't that the way we feel when we're at the bedside? Don't you see me making eye contact, striking an open posture, leaning towards you and nodding emphatically? I think that's the way we all feel when we're at the bedside. Well, here's another medical hero, and he says things that uh, I have several of his quotes in here because he really can say, the way patients uh, express themselves and feel. This is Philip Tumulty, who uh, was at Hopkins in the 70s. And this first line is really one of the impetuses for this book, because I heard it so often from patients. Actually, what many patients miss and resent today is the inability to communicate with their physician in a meaningful manner. Patients have questions they want answers. Fears requiring dissipations, misunderstandings that need clarification, abysmal ignorance about themselves that demand enlightenment. Today, many patients with serious health problems leave their physicians' offices with less comprehension of what is wrong and what they must do to get well than the average customer understands about his car when he drives out of a repair shop. Now, you know, there's truth to that statement, and it's pretty upsetting. And if the patient feels deprived of communication, family members are totally devoid of it. No wonder the resentment. So you question, this was 50 years ago, but to be honest, Lee, I don't think we're doing any better today. So here's the example. This was uh, Frank Johnson. And Frank Johnson, not only a Kenshin Essence physician, a wonderful person, he was a lay preacher in his uh, church. And uh, he was known by everybody to be a really caring patient. But one day on the ward, he was heard criticizing in front uh, of the other nurses on the ward, in front of doctors that were making notes on the ward, the chief nurse of the ward complaining to her about the care of his patient in a very loud uh, way. And then he walked off the ward. 
I knew that uh, supervising nurse, and she was certainly one of the best in the hospital. And when I asked her about it, she said, oh, Dr. Johnson was upset because we didn't weigh his patient. He didn't give me a chance to tell him that the patient refused to be weighed. And when I talked to him about that afterwards, he couldn't believe that he had that behavior. It was just something that happened because he wasn't aware and conscious of what he was doing. And it shows you how these things happen. So your patient expects excellent medical care. You expect your colleagues to treat your patient in a respectful fashion. And the nurses and allied health personnel expect every member of the team to be respectful and supportive. When all involved members are familiar with the manners expected of them, incidents of misunderstanding and hurt feelings are reduced. You can imagine how the nurses on that ward, they really respected that head nurse and to see her uh, criticized by that doctrine. Now, there are issues that occur. And in the book, we talk about how to deal. If you feel your patients are not getting good care, if you feel there's a problem with uh, the nursing care aspects on the ward, there are ways to do it that minimize hurtful behavior. Well, this is another one of my heroes. You may recognize this young woman, Manahana Tishi. She is a young woman who recognized the Flint River lead poisoning. Now in our book, we say you should never publish or do anything that's not peer reviewed. But uh, this young woman did not wait for peer review of her articles because she was worried about the health and safety of her patients. She took a lot of criticism and she uh, risked her career. She's another example of a great immigrant. She's the daughter of Syrian refugees who came to this country and she's made a unbelievable contribution. It's really a story of bravery. She's a remarkable woman. I think you'll enjoy reading her story. So how do you act as an effective physician? What constitutes good bedside manners? Uh, well, the primary reject objective of good manners is to make ourselves agreeable. The lesson is to avoid being inconsiderate and rude, like that doctor was on the ward. And as Dr. Sugarman said, it's not just impolite to do these things, it's morally wrong because it really affects the health and welfare of our patients. So here is another quote from Dr. Tumulty, and it's one of those things that I think tell you how important it is and what you have to do to get the trust of your patient. A clinician must be patient and forbearing, strong and gentle, unselfish and unstinting in his efforts. He must be willing to bite his tongue, to turn his cheek. He must have an attentive ear, as well as the ability to question probably. must create trust and confidence, and his manner must be thoroughness, and he must wear, hear what the patient doesn't say and be sensitive to the anguish that is expressed. So I'll let you read the rest of this in the book, but he really expresses how patients feel and what the doctor has to do to really gain the trust of those patients. That's what this is all about. So we talk about in the book, what is doctor-patient communication? What does it mean to understand the patient's problem? And what does it mean to understand the patient? And you're all aware of the importance of shared decisions. What does that mean? And how does you maintain a relationship with the patient? We're gonna discuss these issues. Well, what is the patient's problem? Well, if you just think the patient's problem is to diagnose the disease, you're gonna miss a lot of the patient's problems. A number of patients are there because their spouse sent them there. And therefore you have to realize what her or his concerns are and, uh, and relate to the spouse as well. Sometimes they're, they're not because they're worried about the disease, they're worried whether these symptoms are gonna affect their ability to work or whether they should be working because of these symptoms. Or maybe they wanna play a sport and they're worried that their symptoms will interfere and that's really why they're there. And finally, many are just anxious and they have symptoms and they just want relief of that anxiety. Why they're there is an important aspect of what you're treating and you need to find out. And then who is the patient? This is an area that I find so many of the trainees miss out. You know, is that patient working? Are they disabled? Are they retired? Do they live by themselves? Do they have family support? 
what is going on with the patients? Because if you don't really understand the patient, then you're not going to understand how to get them to follow your advice, to do the diagnostic test, to take the medicines, to undergo surgery. Understanding them as a person is critical to getting them to buy into those aspects of your care. What is shared decision making? Well, I'll tell you one of the most common things that I see is that you order a bunch of tests and they never get done because when the patient went to get those tests, they found the co-pays were $1,000 and they don't think it's worth doing that. Well, sometimes you don't know if you don't follow up. You have to let them know that if they run into roadblocks that they need to get back to you, that you understand that that can occur. You don't understand how much it's gonna cost them. And this is true of everything. The tests that they have to go through, you have to follow up and see, did you get those tests? What were your concerns? Why you didn't do those tests? You have to maintain a relationship. Now, I will say that the recent use of um, these uh, contacting them at home and talking with them and those kind of visits has helped increase this, but that you have a responsibility to be sure that the tests, medications, and that any misunderstandings that they have after they leave the office, and we're gonna to talk to why they don't listen to you in the office and how you have to follow up on that. Well, here's another hero, a Holocaust survivor that came over. I had experience with him at the NIH and uh, Dr. Brunwald is one of the great innovators and teachers and researchers in cardiovascular medicine and uh, was just an amazing individual. And I think you'll enjoy learning about his story. So we have a chapter that is responding to bias, bullying, and harassment. This chapter was written by two remarkable women, uh, Wynn Morrison and Julia uh, Fowler at the University of Pennsylvania. And I think you'll enjoy what they have to say. It starts with this cartoon, I'm afraid there's a difference between doctors without borders and doctors without boundaries. And I think we would all agree with that. Well, they start with these quotes and I thought these quotes were so meaningful. We are only as blind as we want to be. How many times have you seen aspects of prejudice or harassment that you just ignore and don't make any comments or intervene? And then this comment by Martin Luther King, where injustice anywhere is uh, justice everywhere, that we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied to a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one affects all indirectly. And boy, in medicine, that is so true. And that we have to do a better job of fighting injustice where we see it. So here's a case study. A medical student in her first clinical year rotates with a team supervised by the department of the chair of the specialty. After a few days of working together, he says to her during a moment they are alone in a conference room, I find you very intriguing. She is unsure if the, compliment, if the comment is a compliment, a proposition, or both. She chooses to ignore it and changes the subject. Later, she wonders, did she misinterpret and miss an opportunity for academic mentoring? or did she successfully avoid a very uncomfortable situation? Well, all of the chapters have study questions and the study question related to this was how would you view the chair's comment? And did she appropriately sidestep a difficult situation? And if she had pursued the, that conversation, what were the possible risks and benefits? In 1982, pediatrician, Henry Silver noted that his students were eager and excited at the start of their training, but at the end they displayed symptoms of criticism and depression. He had seen similar personality changes in children who suffered abuse, abuse and neglect. Well, in 1990, he published a study where 46% of medical students reported evidences of abuse early in their training and that by the end of their training, 80% of medical students had experienced some kind of abuse. Now, this was followed up by the American College, uh, the American Medical College at survey in, in 2019, and they found that still about 50% of medical students and often more women medical students and men complain of various types of abuse as students. So it's a real problem 
And uh, we talk about it in the book and how to deal with it. Finally, there's a medical student spending a year working in the laboratory at the prestigious medical institute in a large city. He walks to work a few apartment blocks away almost every day when he enters, the guard at the front desk asked to see his employee ID. A few weeks into the position, he notices that almost no one else is stopped by the guard. He is frustrated and assumed that he's being stopped because he's black. He mentions it to no one and then to a fellow student, and he starts to lose some enthusiasm for his research training program. So how would you relate to this? Is this unconscious or conscious bias? How might you respond to the fellow student if he shared this story with you? And how would you support him? What are the potential consequences of dealing with ongoing discrimination and bullying and bias in your learning environment? Well, in this particular chapter, we talk about the history of diversity and its importance in medicine. We define, that's been an important question, what is bullying, what is harassment, so that you can understand what it is when you see it and experience it. And we talk about medicine has lots of hierarchy. There are residents, there are attendings, and how often those relationships are subject to bullying and harassment. And then we talk about how you should consider responding to problems related to bias and discrimination. So you all recognize Dr. Winger, one of the most remarkable individuals who's uh, mentored literally uh, hundreds and hundreds of women who still in her 90s, travels internationally to lecture, who is an outstanding researcher and has some of the real exceptional articles related to problems from women's uh, heart disease to uh, pulmonary emboli, and uh, continues to be a real mentor for so many individuals. Daniel Dale Williams was a Pennsylvania uh, man, African-American, who went to Chicago Medical School. He taught anatomy there after graduation, but he couldn't practice because he was black. He went to Providence Hospital where he became quite prominent surgeon, developed some interesting uh, approaches to pericardial surgery. He then went on to uh, Washington. He uh, couldn't join the AMA because his local med uh, medical association didn't accept African-Americans. So he was one of the founders of the National Medical Association. And he was also one of the founders of the American College of Surgeons. It's a really interesting story about a man that overcame many prejudices to make great contributions to medicine. So see how we're doing on time. We're gonna talk about office and um, you all are familiar with this that uh, please don't Google my diagnosis until I'm finishing telling you about it. So uh, that's true. So this patient was my real estate agent, a remarkable woman, a widow. She had a son that was a doctor. She had sold homes to many doctors. And she had this experience uh, when she was referred to, for evaluation of a gastrointestinal problem. She said that uh, she had to arrive 45 minutes early. This is common. Even though she filled out all the on online forms, and the online forms were pretty identical to the ones they gave her in the office. When she got to the office, there was a um, clouded glass window. There was a sheet to sign in. No one welcomed her. You go into a hotel, a restaurant, almost anywhere, someone is welcoming you, thanking you for coming, only in a doctor's office. And I will tell you, in the Social Security office, are you treated rudely when you enter the office? The furniture was old and worn. Even my barber has up-to-date magazines. And it just wasn't a very pleasant place to be. Uh, so she waited an hour before uh, she was then told to take all her clothes off and give it a paper ground uh, to wear. Uh, when the doctor came in, he had on a scrub suit, which was fine, but it was wrinkled. She noticed stains, which she hoped were ketchup. He had on a soiled lab coat, and I see this very frequently. Uh, it's unusual to see lab coats that are really white. His was a tinted dull gray, and it had also stains on uh, the front of his sleeves, which she questioned what those stains were. And uh, he didn't introduce himself. He didn't come over and talk to her or shake her hand. He seemed rushed. He went to the computer. He asked her multiple questions as she filled on the form, 
but he asked them so fast that she barely had a chance to say yes or no before he moved on uh, other issues. So uh, I know that there's not one of you that doesn't see a patient with the computer in front of you, but just taking 30 seconds to walk up to that patient, welcoming, hold them in some way with their hand or uh, arm on your shoulder. He then asked her to lie down and the gown opened up and she was embarrassed. Uh, uh, and she, he said, uh, she said, the gown doesn't work well. And he said to her, well, you put it on wrong. And that, that happens frequently. And she felt like an idiot when he told her that. And like I said, this is a very smart woman. Now he examined her and he was pretty thorough in his exam. A comment on this, and we talk about this in the book about the physical exam. Many of you, and it's still controversial, whether the exam is worth the time and whether you're gonna do other tests that are more valuable. But there's no question in the doctor-patient relationship that laying the hands on in some way and laying the hands on real skin, not listening through a shirt, so many patients tell me that the doctor saw them and I thought from the consult he did a good job, but they said, you know, he never touched me. And that means something to patients. And I want you just to be aware of that when you're doing your evaluations. So then he told her, well, I'm gonna run a bunch of tests. And she, you know, she was, you can tell from this that she was quite a, a card. And uh, she said, well, what are you looking for? He said, it'd take too long to explain. And she said, what? Well, Apparently her condition was top secret and she was on a need to know classification. And then he said, uh, by the way, I'm gonna do some procedures. And she said, what procedures? He said, oh, my nurse will talk to you about them. And you know, she said, her nurse? She didn't wanna to talk to the nurse. She wanted him to explain the procedures and he left the room. So I will tell you that she ended up going to her internist and saying she would never go back to that doctor. First impressions are important. And you know they're important because you see other businesses. So welcoming the patient into your, into your office is important. I had a wonderful front office and my patients would often compliment how friendly and helpful they were. And I went up there and thanked them at least once a week. When I asked them if other doctors came into their office, they would say only one, we had eight doctors in the office. So, you know, it's a team effort. You have to support your team. If you want them to treat your patients well, you have to let them know that you appreciate that. The same is true with the nurses. We had a group of nurses that often spent the day making calls, carrying out orders, but they had nobody going back there, no doctors asking if there were any issues that they could help, and they felt very isolated. You need to be involved with the staff in your office. Waiting is a moral issue. Of course, doctors have a regular schedule. Thing causes you to keep delays, but if you keep patients waiting on a regular basis, that is not only rude, it is immoral. This quote at the top of this slide is one of my favorite. You know John Donne, the famous English poet. He had an illness and a long association with his physician who he very much admired. And he said, I observed the physician with the same diligence as the disease. And boy, that is true. Your patient is looking at you every second and how you react and how you behave are gonna have clues to them about what's going on. So what is a successful office visit? Why is the patient there? Did you express empathy? Did you find out who the patient was? When I had uh, my nurses explain to patients how to put the gown on and to ask them if they would like someone in the room with them. Examining naked patients is a special privilege and you have to know whether they would be comfortable with chaperones or not. You have to explain to the patient what you're thinking. The doctor has to explain. I know there's some concern about this in modern medicine, but it's still the role of the doctor. You have to talk about the cost of care and tell them that if the medicines or the tests are too expensive, that you'll be there with them to find alternatives. This chapter talks about abuses and uh, uses of social media. And we're at the beginning of social media and I think you'll find it somewhat elementary, but it's worth considering uh, how you use it. And uh, we encourage you to look at it and see what you think and what you can learn from it. 
The hero of this uh, is Raphael Campo, uh, a wonderful physician. He's the poet for the uh, JAMA, and uh, we have several of his poems in the book. I'm not going to read this poem, but so often poems express feelings in ways uh, of medicine that we can't quite express ourselves, and they're helpful in understanding our patients and our own feelings about practice. Well, we're going to go on to the hospital. And here it says, the good news is your husband is covered by insurance. The bad news is he suffered a mental breakdown uh, in the registration process. And you know, that's uh, probably true. This is a quote from Alvin Feinstein in the 60s, and it's just as true today as it was then. The patient is neither a disease to be discussed nor a showcase of interest. How often we talk about the gallbladder of that person down in room 316 that uh, had this disorder. He's not a dispassionate bystander. He is a sick person in an alien environment of the hospital, disturbed by his illness and involved in it as much as doctors. He is anxious to know what is happening and is entitled and generally able to make contributions to all aspects of his illness. How often have you seen patients in the hospital, written a bunch of orders, but not shared those orders, told them the test you're gonna do, and uh, told them when you're gonna give the results of that test. So we're gonna have a, a short case. I'm not gonna to spend too much time on it, but this is a 68 year old woman who was, went to the emergency room. She'd been having abdominal pain for several days, a history of hypertension. The pain was epigastric, she vomited. And a typical patient, she waited finally to the late in the day because the symptoms just didn't go away before we finally went in to seek care. Well, on her exam, uh, she had a mild tachycardia. She was afebrile. She was pale and cool and sweaty. Uh, the ER doctor ordered a number of laboratory tests, including a CT abdominal scan. She waited six hours. In this COVID time, she waited by herself because the family was not allowed in with her. Finally, the ER doctor decided to get a surgical consult and called the surgeon with the results of the test. The surgeon didn't come for another two hours. So she had been there eight hours before the surgeon saw her and he decided to admit her at that time, start her on IV fluids and NG suction. She then developed a fever. And uh, because of that, the uh, hospitalist had been consulted by the surgeon, asked an infectious disease doctor. She was still pretty ill. She now had family with her in the room. Uh, she had six different people seeing her, the PA for the surgeon, the PA for the hospitalist and the PA for the infectious disease doctor. And then as always seems to happen in my experience, uh, she's hypertensive, they got, uh, she had an abnormal EKG, they got a troponin and that was abnormal. So they got another consult, cardiology this time. And uh, in addition, on the second day, they got a gastroenterology consult. So a total of five physicians, five mid-levels, a person who was still pretty sick, uh, and she was confronted by those 10 people. And I think we have to think about our hospital care. Did all of them need to examine her? Did all of them need to take a thorough history or could it have been limited history? Could the hospital was kind of focused in on what he wanted from each of these doctors? Uh, we're gonna go and talk about that. Uh, after four days, uh, she got better. She was about to have a partial uh, small bowel obstruction and she was discharged to be followed by the surgeon. So was the patient kept informed during those eight hours? Did a nurse come in on a regular basis to let the patient, to check on the patient, see how was doing, tell her the status of her test? Um, could the surgeon have notified the emergency room when he would be there so that uh, at least the patient would know when to expect him? And could she have been admitted earlier? There's no question that she could have gotten more comfort care on the floor than in the emergency room. Was the patient and the family updated on what was going on and could they have been with her earlier? And finally, how did the multiple doctors communicate? And you all know that communication in the hospital is a major problem. So in the book, we talk about chart notes. Now, Back in the 70s at Emory, Dr. Hertz was very interested in the problem-oriented record. And there were grand rounds about three times a week on the uh, problem-oriented record that has disappeared. But chart notes have not improved. 
sometimes because the PAs create them, they're way too long and you can't see what's going on for the forest. And while you can now read everything, it's all printed on a computer, they're not decipherable because they have too much information to understand. So we talk about what is a meaningful chart note, how to write it. Who is in charge? It's so important to identify when you have five physicians, who is making the decisions? Usually it's the hospitals, but it needs to be clear and the hospitalist needs to know that they're the ones that are in charge and that you're, if you're the consultant, giving them information. And then what is the consultant's responsibility? So often the hospitalist just says cardiac consultant, GI consultant, infectious disease. They can be more definition. Is the troponin significant? Do a test need to be done in the hospital or can this be done as an outpatient? Is this a real gastrointestinal problem or is it something that doesn't need to be followed? So those are simple questions that can be answered uh, in a meaningful way and people will not necessarily have to continue to follow the patient every day in the hospital. And how do we communicate? Well, text messages are a wonderful way, but because of identification problems and patient uh, privacy, they are hard to use on a regular basis. Cell phones have become the miracle machine in the hospital. And I can tell you that so many patient problems are resolved with direct doctor-to-doctor -doctor communication. And in the book, I talk about how you shouldn't interrupt a patient ever with your phone, except if you're getting a call from another doctor that you're trying to reach, because those doctor-to-doctor -doctor communications are critical for patient care. And then when you're in a hospital, too many people can talk to the family, and they get family gets different messages and becomes very confused. And so you need to know who is talking to the family. Maybe the hospital will tell you, just tell them whether they need heart tests or not. But those need to be instructions, and the hospitalist needs to be in charge of giving those instructions. So one of the mentors that uh, I had was at Vanderbilt, and this man is a legend at Vanderbilt, Thomas uh, Brittingham. Uh, you're going to enjoy finding. And he was the type of mentor that almost never criticized you. He would get out there and see the patient, do the work himself, and you just learned from him about how to really care for a patient and how to get a history. And boy, he was someone that was really about getting the complete history. So we have a chapter on bad news because many of you in your careers are gonna to have to give bad news. You got a little lecture sometime in medical school that you forget, but there is a science to giving bad news. And how many movies have you seen? I, I saw one recently where uh, someone learns this bad news inadvertently without uh, a real uh, effort by the doctor to do it properly and how hurtful and harmful that is to the individual. So in this chapter, we talk about the science of giving bad news. And that means setting up an interview, rehearsing, asking your patient about their illness and what they expect, uh, seeing how much information they can process. Often if it's really sad news, they're not going to survive. They can't handle that all at one sitting. You want to give them knowledge about the disease and prognostication about what's going to happen. And you want to be able to emphasize and strategize with them. So here's an example. Susan was a nurse, 56-year-old nurse, who was diagnosed with advanced pancreatic cancer, a disease you know carries a 95% mortality. She was uh, recommended to have surgery, and she went to a, a surgical referral center MD Anderson, uh, and there the surgeon uh, looked at her studies and came back to her and said uh, that he did not uh, believe he could do anything. She should just go home. Well, she was devastated. You know, this kind of a comment, uh, there's nothing that can be done for you is not acceptable to her. And she wasn't really ready for that comment. So she went home and when she returned home, she met with her oncologist and he said, you know, I'm gonna do everything possible to treat this disease. We don't know what's gonna happen. We're worried about a bad prognosis, but I'm not gonna leave you. And I'm not gonna not support your care uh, as long as I can. So the referral surgeon's lack of compassion and essentially just dismissing her from his care was devastating. You can't do that. You have to give some hope because when you take hope away, you take their humanity away. She had a generalized sense of hope, a hope 
that well needs something could happen to help her. Her oncologist redirected that to a specific hope, a hope that he was gonna be there for her and he was gonna try everything that he knew to help her. So there are many forms of hope. Even when there is no hope for survival, you can promise them that you're gonna be there with them, you're gonna be sure they don't have any pain, you're gonna help be their family, and that uh, you will escort them through the process. That really makes a difference. Dr. Well, Silverman, I just wanna actually make you aware of that time. We're at one o'clock. We're at one o'clock. Well, then we will, uh, we can stop this because you can always go to the book to read this. We can stop this at any time and we'll stop it here. Uh, the next chapter uh, is on uh, burnout. I will like to read you one comment from that chapter. And, oh, the next chapter is on pediatrics. I introduce you to William Carlos Williams, who's my favorite physician poet. I'm not gonna read this wonderful poet of his, but here is a burnout. We'll just make one comment. Uh, and this was a cartoon. Do you remember when all we had to worry about was the patients? Well, this is a comment from uh, Rothenberger in which he said, I suddenly realized that I have lived in denial of the dark side of medicine the medical profession and its unwritten code. The code that says that medical students should keep their mouths shut, that residents can be blamed since that's how we learn, that repeatedly being pushed to the brink of exhaustion is a necessary part of a caring physician, and that if few fall out along the way, it is because they were weak and somehow deficient. Somehow I escaped, survived, and thrived, but it's not clear to me. Why was I not one of those statistics? This was in response to one of his students committing suicide. And so, you know, in these ages, uh, burnout is a really serious problem. And we talk about it and how to deal with it. So uh, I hope I've interested you in this book and that you would like to go further and, and learn more about what we have to say on the art of medicine. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, there's so many pearls of wisdom in um, all those lessons from, um, from you and from great physicians through the ages. Um, so, um, so I really appreciate that. Um, Dr. Stevens just put a, a, another recommendation in the chat as well, uh, referencing your comments about Thomas Crittenham, uh, the doctrine in the age of scientific medicine. Um, so I hope you take a peek at the chat because you're getting some um, lovely comments. Um, and I really, again, want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. It was a wonderful experience. All right.